And if it if the horse falls on the rider, mm -hmm. this is then pa. Oh, yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's come back to your school. You have 10 levels in your school, right? Level one, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, could you explain these levels just because, you know, imagine someone wants to come and learn at your school. And could you tell us and expand on your level so we know what you teach, how people, I mean, how long would each level? I mean, of course, it's individual, like any other martial art or skills. Mm -hmm. But just uh, explain to us how long, what do you learn? How long would each level take? approximately for a good student dedicated student yeah well we have we have 10 riding and horsemanship levels but we only have five ranks oh. so uh the first rank uh we color code them so first rank is green spur or apprentice level and that would be riding level one horsemanship level one and then sword play level one and then for the second level which is blue spur we need up, you need um, riding and horsemanship. Uh, you need up to level five riding and horsemanship. Uh, and then, sorry, well, I'm losing track here. No, level three, <laughs> level three. And, and then uh, the red spur, you need up to level six. Silver, level eight. And then um, level 10 for gold. So that gold would be master level. We don't, you know, we don't have anyone that's progressed through the program um, farther than red. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of commitment. And as long as that would take in a, in a regular sword school to go through sort of levels from apprentice through free scholar and provost and things like that, it takes that much longer if you're, if you're combining it with horses. So, yeah. Um, and again, it depends, you know, we, a lot of people do come with a, with a fairly good starting level of, of riding and horsemanship. Um, do you also teach wrestling on horseback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot, the historical manuals have a lot of wrestling plays. Um, you know, there's a lot in the German manuals and in Fiore, uh, all sorts of great things you can do on horseback. <laughs> Could you, you know, in our channel, there are many wrestlers, judoka, Brazilian jiu-jitsu grapplers, because um, our channel is mostly watched by martial artists, and most of them are grapplers. Could you explain something about this grappling on horseback? Because this question, many people ask me to ask Jan about that. For example, just tell us, I mean, okay, they don't have any riding experience, but just for, uh, for us, it would be very interesting to see what can you do on horseback, uh, you as well, an expert rider. Well, one of one of the things about riding on or grappling on horseback is it's it's a dangerous proposition because as easy as it is to throw your opponent, it's just as easy to be thrown yourself. Like like any time you you get into wrestling, um, but you you only have from the waist up. You can't you can't use your hips. You can't use your legs. So you are only grappling from you know with your upper body. And so the the secret just like when you're wrestling on the ground, the secret is to bring your opponent into your center. Um, even more so on horseback, you're trying to bring your opponent into onto your horse almost. Um, and some of the plays do actually end up with the opponent across your own front of your saddle. You can right away take them hostage and sell them back to their parents. <laughs> so. <laughs> I really like this one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah there are there are some like there are a lot of there are a lot of pommel hook plays so and partly what it is is that you're you're continually going forward so unlike a sword fight where you're going in and out of measure and you're circling and and you can back away yeah. with a horse you you don't back up you know you oh, so you're just going forward and so you close that measure and you get from your your wide measure into your narrow measure and then you're at grappling measure Right, and it happens that fast. So, you know, sometimes, so say, you know, if I throw a blow at you and you parry it and our horses are moving fast, well, I'm gonna yield into the pommel strike. And if you see that pommel strike coming, you're going to turn that into a pommel hook and bring it into your center and, and we're grappling. And it just happens so fast. So there are, there are only, 
um, in Fiore, there are only, you know, a couple of plays of a couple of sword play at close measure, a couple of sword play plates at wide measure, and there are seven pommel hooks and strikes in the mounted section. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, um, it, it's a big part. And also, you know, there's a lot of grappling moves coming from behind where you're, you're grabbing the opponent's shoulder and, and, you know, then you counter that with a, uh, with an upper key, you can do that with a, with a sheep grip, things like that. So yeah, it's, there's a lot. Um, I have two questions for you. You know, coming from wrestling background, I learned Greco-Roman and then I went to freestyle. In Greco-Roman, the first thing, okay, when you learn is once I want to wrestle, I need to clear uh, the arms and the hands out of the way. Right. So I mean, I'm free. Okay, we don't talk about freestyle because Greco-Roman is without legs. So one thing is, for example, the first thing I need to do is to lower my base, for example, to hit the person here, right? Push the hands up and then I can go and grab. And once mm -hmm. I grab, I, I need to have my waistline always lower than my opponent. And then I can pick him up or pick her up, right? Yeah. And how do you do it on horseback? You don't pick them up. Okay, you don't pick them You're up. not picking them up. You're trying to send them to the ground. Yeah, that's the right? difference. So a lot of it is, some of it is head control. If you can get your hand on your opponent's head and you just push and they go down so easy. Right? Like, <laughs> okay, very interesting. Yeah, but there's no, you would never try to lift. You're always, um, one of the lifting, the only time there is a stirrup grab where yeah. you, you can grab your opponent's leg or stirrup and lift that, and then that'll topple them off the horse. Uh, but that's a really risky move because as soon as you go low to grab that stirrup, they're going to grab your head and send, and you're going to keep going low, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, of course. Uh, Jen, if I bring, now I'm just trying to ask you some questions as a writer because I can use your knowledge and expertise on that. If I ride my horse next to your horse, or the person, and then I grab the person, let's say, like in judo, I mm -hmm. grab this arm here, pull, and mm -hmm. then put my hand above the neck, and yep. then make my horse go away and turn my upper body. Would it work on horseback? Yeah, that is that is one of the initial grabs, is to sort of reach around like a, like a friendly hello around the shoulders. Yeah. Um, and, and the, but what you would be trying to do is to pull this way. You wouldn't want to be pulling them forward. You'd want to grab that far shoulder and turn them so that their back goes up, go, you know, they're turning and then they go down. Right. The counter to that, if somebody comes up behind you, like somebody's right here, they come up behind me and they put their hand on my far shoulder. I'm going to send my arm up and down just, and just like this and bring it to my waist. And that just puts them in a in a beautiful sheep grip um, here, and they just end up in front of my saddle. Yeah. So the, the real key in, in trying to throw people is to get them to lose that center line. You think about, you think about a carousel horse, you know, you've got the pole going up the center of the, the horse that's on the merry-go-round. Yeah. You want that pole going right through your spine. Yeah. And anytime that comes off, the center in any direction you're at risk of, of going off so um do you also teach wrestling on ground or do yeah. you mix them oh, okay yes yeah it really helps like to have that i mean we don't uh we don't spend a lot of time wrestling but we do we do teach all of fiore's uh, masters and scholars of wrestling um all the you know different keys and and throws and things so, because it, it just helps to have that body awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, are there also other manuscripts? Not that I'm a big fan of different types of manuscripts, but are there other manuscripts uh, which teach wrestling as well? Or is it fewer? Yeah, yeah the, the, the German tradition has, has quite a few. Um, in like, well, there's the, you know, Lichtenauer and then all the various illustrated manuscripts that go with that. Um, so you can see some in the Goliath manuscript. There's quite a few interesting wrestling plays there. Um, and uh, Paulus Kahl 
Uh, there's some in there and some in Talhofer. Uh, on horseback as well, correct? Yeah. Wrestling. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you teach archery also on foot and on horse. Um, of course, you need to learn archery on foot before you can be you are able to <laughs> shoot on horseback. Of <laughs> course, so you teach both of them, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't teach the archery. I I bring people in to do that. Okay. But really, we are teaching when we do a workshop. We're teaching horseback archery from the ground, but it's still like it's. We spend very little time learning to shoot on the ground you know you'll spend like a beginner's workshop is about three hours long you spend about an hour on the ground learning to shoot and then and then we we lead the horses and we get people up on the horses and and shooting from horseback um, um uh, when i was i was invited to teach in mongolia the mongolians told me the horse Okay, I don't know if it's superstition, but well, the Mongolians told me the horse can tell if you like it or not. Oh yeah, they can. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. Could you please tell us more about that? Oh, absolutely. Horses, horses are very perceptive to human facial expressions, and body language, and and moods. Like they, they, and they've done studies where they show that. You know, they, they can tell the difference between a photo of a person smiling and a person, you know, with an angry expression. So they, and, and they know if you, if you don't like them, they know. And it will have consequences for your writing, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what the Mongolians told me. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have, we have some horse, like, you know, we have one horse who's, she's quite, she's quite old. She's been a school horse for a long time and she's quite cranky. Okay. And, and, you know, and some people will, you know, they tolerate that and, and she's less cranky with them. And some people, you know, really don't like her and she just really doesn't like them back. <laughs> so it's like, she, she is, she is selectively nice to the people who are nice to her. <laughs> and what happens when she's not nice People. Oh, she tries to, she tries to bite. She paws. She gets really, she gets really snarly when she's being tacked up or picking her feet out. Okay. That much. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when, when I listen, when I listen to you and you say that horses are very perceptive. So it means that if I spend a lot of time as you and you're as a professional spend a lot of time with horses, would it also help you to develop your sense of perceptions and interaction with other human beings? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Is it like a transfer? It might, just because you become better at watching body language from working with horses because they don't speak. So you learn you learn their body language and you learn to you know, you you learn to perceive their moods. So that might make you better at perceiving human body language as well. So there are some similarities. Horses actually have very similar expressions to ours. They have similar, the facial muscle, they have, they have matching facial muscles. So, you know, um, a horse, a horse that's worried, its eyebrows go up like this and you can, you, it gets the pointy eyebrows of, so, of somebody who's worried. And if they're stressed, if they're tense, their mouths get very tight and you can see the muscles in here. Like it's almost like they're sucking lemons or something. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay, um, that's very interesting. And uh, do you teach that as well to your students in your school to read yeah. the horses' reactions? Okay. Oh yeah, that's that's like almost lesson one. That's that's really important. Okay. Does such a thing as horse whispering exist? That you can talk to your horses and the horses can really understand and follow you? Is does such a thing? Horses exist? horses do. Horses can understand human language, like they can, they are trainable to voice cues and they do, you know, I mean, they don't understand English per se or German per se, they, but they, they can understand tone. So they, they understand tone very clearly and they can learn certain words. So they will, you can verbally cue them walk to rot. Is you know uh, canter, you know, you, and 
they learn those. Um, they don't they don't have quite as large a vocabulary as dogs, but they still have a pretty large vocabulary. Um, but I think horse the horse whispering like the Monty Roberts is is really they're not whispering to the horses. They're just they're understanding horses' body language and communicating okay. yeah, and able to communicate back to the horse using similar language. Okay. I understand that. And, uh, and uh, how long can you, if you have a horse and you go riding, what is advisable? I mean, is it like, you cannot say rule of thumb, only go two hours or three hours riding with a horse? Is it something, something like that? You cannot ride the whole day, every day with one horse, right? Am I correct? Well, it depends on the horse and how fit the horse is. I mean, or it depends on what kind of riding you're doing. So if you're just walking, if you're riding over trails, you can you can ride all day. I used to, my girlfriend and I, when we were kids, used to get on our horses and, and we'd be gone all day. We'd be up the mountain, um, but our horses were quite fit and you know used to that sort of riding. So uh, you can, and you know we would be more sore at the end of that than our horses would be just from being in the saddle all day. Uh, but it just depends how fit your horse is, just like humans, you know, you know, some, some humans can work all day on a physical job and some, some humans can work for an hour in a physical job. And it just depends what you've been trained for. And that's changeable, right? Your horse can get out of shape too. Oh, really? Oh yeah. Because they get sick or? Oh, no, they're just, if they're not worked, they get out of shape just like us. Of course, they put on weight, you mean, or things like that. Well, they just lose fitness, right? It's not oh, so much fitness level. Okay. It's not so much weight. I mean, you can you'll see a horse's shape change as the muscling in its back. As a horse gains fitness and works more, it'll put more weight, it'll put more muscle along the back and neck, and it actually changes the shape of the horse. And then when they get if they are left in a field or worse, left in a paddock for a long time, they they lose that muscle and they get the saggy back and yeah. Um, let's come back to your school and for people who are, I mean, hopefully COVID is going to be away, go away. We're going to be vaccinated and all these things. Uh, do you also teach international people who will come from other countries to your uh, school or could you just tell us? I'm sure yeah. many people would be interested. Okay. Yeah, we have, um, well, in non COVID times, we have, um, intensive so you can come and spend five days in a row training um, and you would do you do riding and horsemanship and mounted combat a sword play on the ground and on horseback every day for five days um, and we do a la carte programs too for people who only have a weekend to train or something like that but mm. yeah we've had people come from from the states and canada and um and lots of people saying they wanted to come from Europe last year and then everything shut down, but. <laughs> of course. Where are you located in uh, Canada? I mean, I know just for people who. Yeah, it's, it's very far west. We're all the way over in British Columbia. Um, so we're about an hour away from Vancouver. Very, very interesting. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking your time. Uh, would you like to share something else from your experience riding horsemanship, swordsmanship, or your martial arts experiences with our uh, viewers here on Razmafsar TV channel? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you that if you want to start practicing, if you don't have a horse, you've never done anything, uh, just practice doing all all your martial arts from horse stance. So if you know horse stance in, in Chinese martial arts, that's why it's called horse stance. You keep your legs and your hips still and do all your sword play, your cutting, all, all those things just from the waist up. And you will begin to be training to do that from horseback. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, of course. We have it in Chinese martial arts, Japanese horse yeah. stance. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Keep them still. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. very good advice, very good piece of advice. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jan, for uh, taking your time. It was an, I'm honored and it was a pleasure to have you on our channel. Thank you very much. And I'm going to put uh, the descriptions of the school of Jan here and also a link uh, so you can follow and you can contact her. And then uh, thank you for taking your time. 
and have a nice day, Jan. Yes, it was my pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you very much.